everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. OK, good. My name is Kyle Cherick, and I am delighted to welcome you to Madison College's Chef Demo Series presented by Volrath, a terrific Wisconsin, over 140-year-old Wisconsin uh, manufacturer of great kitchenware and professional cookware. To my right is Chef Sean Sherman. Chef Sherman, yeah, right? <laughs> Let's do that. Chef Sherman is the recipient through his uh, cookbook uh, of the James Beard Award for the Best Cookbook in America 2018. <laughs> Beyond that, he is both the CEO and founder of The Sous Chef, has been cooking in the Americas in Mesoamerica for over 30 years, and uh, is from the Lakota tribe, grew up in South Dakota, though we won't hold that against him. Uh, but we will hold the fact that he lives in Minnesota now against him. <laughs> um, it's almost Wisconsin. Yeah, you're, clo you're close. Are you a Vikings fan? Uh, I don't really watch TV. Yeah, good, good, good answer. Good answer. All right, we can applaud that too. Um, of the many, many, many culinary professionals that I've had the privilege to know, he stands apart in so many ways. Uh, the distinctions in his essentially acquainting America's culinary tradition with its first flavors and indigenous styles of cooking are both uh, important but really timely for where we are in our culture. He is the only chef that I've ever had the privilege to know that has presented both at the Culinary Institute of America, Yale University, and the United Nations. Wow. Mm -hmm. His commentary on NPR on Thanksgiving uh, telling a great deal of the true story of that, of that uh, holiday was a clear light from a lighthouse through the foggy and mythologized history of America. And uh, of all of the chefs in, in pure honesty that I invited to be part of this series here at Madison College, when Sean said yes, I had the most enthusiasm and actually even goosebumps. <laughs> so uh, I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, we're, we're just so, it's a really great, it's a great honor. And um, we're going to plumb a little bit into your history, uh, how you got to where you are now in your path. Um, I drove. You drove. <laughs> <laughs> Four hours from Minneapolis, I asked him. <laughs> um, uh, and what it means to be, to be uh, bringing forth what you are in America's culinary tradition at this time, basically in our cooking history. Right. So let's start with the cookbook. Uh, it won, um, which basically the most preeminent, the preeminent award that you can get as an American cookbook, the James Beard Foundation. Oh, and I also forgot to mention that uh, Chef Sherman, um, I think, is the most legit chef, and this is a huge statement, to ever have cooked at the James Beard House because his dinner was a decolonization dinner at the James Beard House. Yeah. which Indigenous foods of Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and for those of you that are familiar with the James Beard House and the foundation, the house is what I call a living repository, the Smithsonian of cooking. Mm -hmm. So to have Chef Sherman there and say, well, these are the foods that were actually here long before this brownstone, long before James Beard, long before they mispronounced the word Manhattan, uh, <laughs> Manhattan, right? Yeah, I yeah. Mean, there was a village, but it was different. You know? Yeah, right, right, <laughs> exactly. So um, having won that award, uh, when you did win, I basically stood up and said, this is the first actual American cookbook that has ever won this seminal award. Well, you know, before me, um, there was a great Native American chef that's still out there today, Lois Allen Frank, and she actually won a James Beard, uh, same category, the American uh, Best American Cookbook um, in the 90s for her Foods of the Southwest. So I had a predecessor for sure coming into this. But for us to get that notoriety, of course, and ours was, of course, a little bit different. The cookbook's behind you at some point in that way. <laughs> but um, there you it know, is. we just really wanted to um, do something a little bit different. We really wanted to focus on the pre-colonial ingredients 
dance and the history, um, and just giving people a different perspective of the land that they're standing on. Because it's insane to think about cities all across America, New York, Manhattan, Brooklyn, right? Um, Chicago, LA, um, zero Native American restaurants. Mm -hmm. And that just seems completely insane in this time and age when we should be really thinking about where we are. Um, and obviously there's a lot of Native American communities all across the board. Right, I mean with Lois's book, I always thought of that as basically throwing off the shackles of cliched Southwest cooking mm -hmm. and bringing it back to its roots, whereas yours was, as you said, pre-colonial. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can go to Chicago, LA, New York, wherever, and you can go to seven different Italian restaurants that are cooking through the seven or eight, or well, there's actually 14 different regions of cuisine in Italy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and they're busy, at least on weekends, uh, but there are not seven Native American restaurants <laughs> <laughs> representing all these different flavor all these profiles. Different regions. Yeah. yeah. So we look at North America. Um, if you look at North America with an indigenous language map, that will kind of help you see how diverse North America really is. Because you can see all these patches of all these different languages across the board from Mexico all the way up through Alaska, through Canada, the US, the whole works. And we just celebrate that diversity because still today there's still 573 tribes in the U.S., 622 in Canada, and 20% of Mexico still speaks an indigenous language. So there's so much that we should be really celebrating on the land that we happen to stand on, and understanding that history goes back longer than Laura Ingalls Wilder. <laughs> uh, you, you and your cooking and the prominence of it has been a personal party favorite of mine. When people come up to me and say, oh, we love Wisconsin foodie, and we're big foodies, and we love exploring new flavors we just ate at this great new Thai restaurant last night and I will say well that you know that's exciting and fascinating but um, what do you know about indigenous cuisine and they're like <laughs> you mean an old supper club? <laughs> um, and and then in the same and then it's not to mock people, but in the same in the same vein, when people talk about farm to table, uh, your farm to table tips the whole thing on its ear and says that the land is the farm and the larder and the source of flavor. And let's go back to those things. Not even go back to the. Let's just get to those things because they've always been there. Mm -hmm. It's it's us that haven't been looking in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that the flavors disappeared. Yeah. So it's looking at this wonderful land that we stand on. And again, no matter where we are, we're standing on indigenous land. And people have been utilizing the plants around us for so long. All these indigenous communities had this blueprint of how to survive sustainably utilizing just the plants and animals, mm -hmm. which is an amazing. Knowledge knowledge base to have, which has been obviously completely overlooked because we're so far removed from, from where we are. You know, because I have chef friends and they're excited about some of the stuff. They're like, hey, where can I get some balsam fur? Or no, they're like, where can I get some Douglas fur? It's like, well, you have to fly to Washington probably to get that. Yeah. Like, well, what's around here? It's like, we can get balsam fur. It's like, where do I get that? Who can I order it from? It's like, well, it's... <laughs> outside, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's just being, you know, that far removed from our foods. And, yeah. you know, it's really important to think about that we can absorb a lot of this ancestral knowledge that the indigenous communities had had for centuries and for millennia, um, surviving off of these wonderful plants all around us. So, you know, it's just like you have to stop calling everything a weed. That just means you don't know what it is, right? You have to take the time to learn what these plants are for, because most of them are food. And when you have we look at the plants with an indigenous perspective. So it's food, it's medicine, or you can do something with it. You can craft with it, you can make dyes out of it, you can do all sorts of stuff with it. So it's really understanding the true value of the world that we're literally standing on and why it's really important to hold on to these natural resources. Because we've seen such, uh, in history of, of where we are, we've seen such a destruction of our natural resources with immense deforestation, you know, environments changing almost overnight in mm -hmm. so many different areas. But we still have all these plants that thrive and want to be here. You know, so we talk about how people really should um, think about using that land space better, looking for some of these ancestral um, farming seeds and things that have been growing in these regions for a long time, um, looking at um, just a better space because we can landscape any way we want to. We should be putting food every single space that we can, you know, because lawns are stupid, right? We should be putting food <laughs> down because uh, that's a waste of space. It's a waste of energy, right? You know, because we can just be putting all sorts of plants down that could feed us, that can heal us, that can do all sorts of stuff. And these are the lessons that we should be teaching teaching our kids. Because I talk a lot um, of uh, doing all these talks and going to lots of places and working with kids. And it's unfortunate because you know kids today, they can name more Kardashians than they can tree species, right? 
I can't, uh, I can't name any of the Kardashians, and it's a personal <laughs> point of pride of mine. But I'm also kind of, I'm kind of low on tree species, so yeah. So it's important just to be aware of the world around us, right? You know. Well, I love the story that when you were presenting at Yale or the CIA, the Culinary Institute of America, which is just north of New York, and I don't know which one it was, but you know, the, the you, they were getting close to your presentation time, and the, the people that were setting up were like, "Where's Sean and his assistant?" And you were like, you were on the hill back behind the the whatever, like getting in. Ingredients. <laughs> like, he's out getting ingredients. Like, well, when's he going to get back? I don't know. He's just on the side of the hill. It's not a big deal. It's like 40 yards away. Um, but you literally were getting ingredients for your cooking demo. Yeah, because we're like, let's just see what's around here. So the first they assigned a young chef to me when I got there. This was in Napa. Okay. And they're like, let's go see what we can find. You know, yeah. so we're crawling around this hillside. You know, it's a little precarious, and <laughs> you know, and it's, it's really. But that's the way we should think a little bit. Like, um, I was. Also at the CIA, the Culinary Institute of, uh, in um, Hyde Park, up in New York, right, and um, doing a lot of great stuff with the chefs. And we literally just walked around the campus, and the, all those professors didn't even really think to look right outside their own domain. You know, wow. like you can eat that. It's like yeah, it's a crab apple. Like you know, yeah. you should you know be. They're like the leaders of the culinary world. You know, you have to include exactly where you are because they have all these beautiful little European gardens and everything with all these herbs and stuff, and it's beautiful. Hmm. But there's also a whole world right around them that they weren't even paying attention to. And it's like that everywhere, basically, right? What a great lesson, yeah. <laughs> so talk about your path, because you are, uh, you're self-taught twice. You're self-taught in the basic American cooking scheme when you first, just first started cooking at 13 in kitchens. And then you're self-taught in the indigenous uh, tradition and flavors. So, I mean, it's your story to tell. But. Sure. Um, I started cooking mostly out of necessity because um, I grew up on Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. Um, my mom, uh, my parents split up when I was pretty young, and my mom moved us off the reservation right before I started high school. Um, and like a lot of families on the reservation, we didn't have a lot of money, so she was going back to school. She was working three jobs, raising myself and my sister, and I started cooking at home a lot for for both of us, for my mm -hmm. mom, or for my sister and myself. Um, and then I just got a restaurant job as soon as I could, so I got I was able to get a restaurant job in South Dakota in 13, when I was 13, just barely turned 13. I think they'll hire you at any age in South Dakota, really. They, <laughs> I had a driver's license when I was 14, so. Right. <laughs> it's all relative. <laughs> but, you know, so I worked uh, restaurants all through high school and college in the Black Hills. There's lots of touristy places around there mm -hmm. and lots of steakhouses, you know, very typical American fare. And then I moved to Minneapolis um, shortly after college and just jumped right into the restaurant scene still and moved my way up really quickly so I became an executive chef in Minneapolis around the 2000 mark right. and worked at some really great restaurants around the uptown region of yeah. Minneapolis and downtown um, and really got into that farm to table kind of movement um, when it was up and coming in Minneapolis early on mm -hmm. and it was great to work with the farmers and ranchers in our vicinity and start utilizing different produce and kind of cutting out the big box trucks and things like that. And then a few years into my chef career, though, is when I had the epiphany um, all of a sudden that, you know, Minneapolis was a cool food city. I can walk around uptown and find food from all over the world in just a few few short blocks. Right. And there was just nothing that represented the land that, that we're standing on again. I just had that, uh, just saw that missing piece. There was just no Native American restaurants. And doing a quick search online, realizing it was like that basically everywhere. And trying to order cookbooks, I wanted to just get online and see whatever I could get. And and I couldn't go on and order Joy of Native American Cooking because it didn't exist. You know? I had to really figure it out. So. That was actually, he considered that as a title for the book that won the James Beard. It's on the short list. I saw the whiteboard. So yeah, I have to create yeah. my own Joy of Native American Cooking. So, you know, so it just shot me on a path to try to understand because, you know, my family was uh, from Lakota and it wasn't going back that far in history. I was born in 1974. Mm -hmm. um, and You look good, by the way. Thanks. Yeah. But, you know, when I was born in 1974 in Pine Ridge, it hadn't even been 100 years since the Lakota had lost the Black Hills in that area. They were still trying to fight for their way of life um, within that 100-year right. period. Right. So not a lot of time has passed. So it took a lot of understanding to realize how did we lose a lot of this knowledge? Like, how come I grew up on Pine Ridge knowing very little about Lakota foods, you know? Because I could name just barely a handful of foods that I, could, that I thought were really tra traditional that would have lasted past the colonial ingredients before European kind of mixed into the food system. 
systems. You know, so foods that didn't include cream of mushroom soup, basically, right? <laughs> and you know, and I just really wanted to understand, like, what were they eating? How were they gathering? Were they growing things? Who were they trading with? Um, where did they get salts, fats, and sugars? And mm -hmm. you know, understanding that they had a huge knowledge of the plants around them again, because they it was. You know, we look at what is indigenous education, and indigenous education was that thousands of generations of knowledge being handed down and basically giving you that blueprint how to survive with the plants and animals around right. you, right. realizing the, the value of everything. So for us, uh, for me, it was that trying to understand all of that. And I wasn't trying to do a timepiece and cook like it was 1491. I really wanted to absorb all of that knowledge and information to be able to apply it to what we were doing today because there was so much health in it, you know? So for us, for me, starting the sous chef um, and some of the businesses that we've done, so we have we've had a catering company open for four years. We mm -hmm. had a food truck called Tatanka Truck, mm -hmm. um, and you know we were really excited about Tatanka Truck it's because. Good. Yeah. We wanted to, um, you know, it was going to be this cool Native American truck. We're going to focus just on regional indigenous foods where we were. So primarily just Ojibwe and um, Dakota influenced foods right in that area. And we just really were excited about it. But we also knew that there wasn't going to be any sodas or Gatorades or any of that kind of stuff. There was going to be no fry bread. And we we're kind of like, are we just going to piss everybody off by make, <laughs> making the coolest Native American food truck and not serving any fry bread on it? You know? <laughs> right. But we wanted to showcase there was so much more awesome stuff, you know, because we wanted to buy from indigenous vendors first. So we got all of our fish from Red Lake, mm -hmm. um, wild rice from uh, the various reservations around Minnesota, Wisconsin, maple, um, a bunch of great um, uh, farm produce, you know, so there's all these cool corns and beans and squash all over the place and started just being creative with this base of food and showcasing that it could still be done and cutting out things like dairy, wheat flour, processed cane sugar, not even using beef, pork, and chicken just to prove the point that it could still be done. And there's plenty of proteins out there. Right. right. I feel like food trucks is really the great gateway drug, pardon the phrase, but well, because people have a different adventure to adventurous uh, approach to food trucks. You know, I think all of us have walked up food trucks. I thought, well, Peruvian. I don't know anything about, it, but I'll try it. You know, like why not? And so that was probably terrific, and I know it's been really successful. Yeah, so the food truck was great. We ran it for about two and a half years, and we just sold it off to the White Earth Reservation in Minnesota as we're getting ready, because we have these big yeah. restaurant projects coming up. Right. So we're just trying to streamline ourselves, and you know we have broad visions of what we want to do, but um, we feel there's a need for it everywhere, and that's our vision that we're going to try and make happen. Was there ever a time when you were pulling together recipes, and you were like, oh, it'd just be so easy if I could get some wheat or something <laughs> like that, and you're like, God, if just just a little butter would be great right here. Um, you know, it was really kind of freeing to remove those ingredients and to, thi and to think about the foods in a different manner. So yeah, at first, like when we're trying to make cornbread, like, OK, we're not going to use any dairy. We're not going to use any butter. Ooh. We're not going to use any flour mm -hmm. or even desserts, right? That's basically dessert, every dessert <laughs> recipe. Right, you know? right, right. <laughs> no sugar. Yeah. So it, you know, it took some time because we were at first, we were stuck in that kind of colonial perspective of how food should be cooked, which was a very European, especially French influenced um, mm -hmm. base. And we basically had to get to a point where we just threw away all of that and started from the ground up. So it's kind of like learning an instrument, you know, you spend right. all this time learning technique um, and then eventually you get to a point where you can start to freestyle and you can, you know, right. pull from that base if you need to, but you can realize you can go any direction if you want to. And ours was, it was great to put ourselves in that box to try to challenge ourselves as chefs to cook in this manner. And also just t making, taking the steps to choose to make only healthy foods. That's all we were going to do. We're only going to serve mm. healthy foods because we feel we're, it's responsible, you know. Yeah. There's enough uh, foods out there and you see all these popular foods and nothing's really that great for you, you know. When you have hamburgers that are this tall with a whole bunch of fried stuff on it and there's things sticking out of them, you know. Right. And, you know, it's fun, but, you know, we feel like we have enough health issues out there in the world and it's really about, we want, we want to nourish people, not only with the food, but with the knowledge and the stories behind the food. Um, and, you know, this resilience that this that this food carries because of the stories behind it, you know. So there's so much more to it. So you're really like the um, I don't know. You're like the healthy theolonious monk of uh, indigenous <laughs> cooking. Like the freestyling, you have the health aspect. You got all that in place. How do you balance? Um, you're a chef cooking in the 21st century. There are all these incredible technological innovations. Uh, we've landed humans on the moon. We've got tang. Uh, we've got induction burners. But then there are these techniques that the flavor only comes out uh, through certain methods that are authentic and, and you know, 
time period specific. So how do you balance that in your cooking? Well, to hold on to the authenticity of the foods that we try to do, we really have tried hard to not fusionize even within the other indigenous groups around us, right? So it's not, and we, you can do it, it's fine. It's just the structure that we set up. So we wanted to cook really like, if we're here in Wisconsin, like what flavors can we pull that would be from right here mm -hmm. Compar compared to Manhattan, compared to Seattle, compared to um, Taos or something right. like that, right? Right. So every, or way down in the Yucatan, right? Everywhere is different. Um, so we wanted to showcase, like, everywhere you are, there's all sorts of beautiful foods to pull from. I mean, you can literally just throw a dart at a map of North America and start right there, because there's going to be a bunch of cool stuff to utilize. Yeah. Too. And that was the challenge. Like, how can we cook with just the foods, flavors, and histories of right in this region? Um, so understanding that base and understanding how simple the foods are and keeping those foods simple and keeping those, food, those flavors prominent for what they are was an important part of how we were going about this, because the foods were very simple. We can make the foods look beautiful. Like if you look in the cookbook, there's all sorts of great pictures of wonderful plates. But overall, like all those pieces that go into that plate are really simple pieces. You know, right. they're just like some beans, just light with like one ingredient seasoned. Um, or there's like uh, the the nixmalized corn that mm -hmm. goes so back in so far back in history. But also because we are in this modern world, we utilize a lot of our skills that we have as professional chefs and utilize these large kitchens that we have um, with all these modern tools because that way we can cook for you know hundreds of people thousands of people at a time because you know it's great to know how to use all these tools it's great to be able to know how to pound corn in a mortar and pestle but if you're cooking for thousands of people it's also great to utilize you know some machinery here and there too that can make the job really fast too so it's a fine balance you know so yeah. we're just kind of at this point of you know evolving this food for the first time in quite a while because we look at the history of how Native America has been handled handled, right? We see the 1800s as the time period when the U.S. government really pushed hard and took over a lot of these indigenous lands throughout most of North America. Ethnic cleansing. Basically. Yeah. And then you see the 1900s of this kind of perpetual state of them, like the, you're on your reservations, you guys just stay there, mm -hmm. right, basically. So the 1900s become basically an entire century of oppression, you know, because it wasn't even, we couldn't even vote on Pine Ridge up until the 70s, Jesus. right? And actually, you know, even even, there's another weird history piece like uh, a lot of people might know about the Dakota uprising in the 1860s when the Dakota people were trying to hold on to their way of life and they started clashing with the newly formed state of Minnesota and were eventually subdued um, a whole bunch of them got hung in Mankato um, and then the rest of them are rounded up and put onto a concentration camp in Fort Snelling which is right mm -hmm. between you know yep, Minneapolis and Paul right. and then the US government actually passed an act called the Dakota Expulsion Act which made it illegal for Dakota people to be in Minnesota and there was actually a bounty out on Dakota people. So if you're caught in Minnesota, you can get $20. And 8, 20 bucks in 1863 was like $800 or something like that. But it wasn't just if you're caught. It was for their head. It was far more gr grotesque. Yeah, body part, head, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then, but the, the craziest part is that time goes on. People, the Dakota people move back. There's, res there's Dakota reservations now in Minnesota. But that act was never removed. So still today, it's actually illegal to be Dakota in Minnesota, in your homeland because of that act that happened in 1863. So how are you not just pissed off <laughs> all the time uh, and like trying to force this cuisine down our throats in the best and worst way possible? I mean, uh, I think probably everyone in this room has their own, right, select group of resentments. Uh, you would have a pretty legitimate one. Well, you know, we look at food as something that's healing. I mean, food is something that we all have in common, no matter our background, no matter who we are, no matter where we come from. Mm -hmm. And our food of our ancestors is something that we hold on to that's so special to us. For a lot of indigenous peoples in different various areas, um, a lot of that knowledge, food knowledge was wiped off the map during the assimilation periods, you know, in the early 1900s and still today, really. Right, right. Um, and so we look at food as something that can really showcase and really bring a better understanding, especially to native cultures where people should have a better understanding of native cultures, of the land that they're standing on, because this was all native land and still yeah. is native land, you know? Yeah. So for the work we do, we stay on a very positive uh, path, and we just showcase the beauty of this food, the beauty of this knowledge that people can really truly understand of having that connection with the earth and the plants and the animals and that spirituality that goes along with it, um, and just so much more that people can really utilize. You can go outside your back door and you just have so much food and medicine right there that's been completely underutilized, you know? Yeah. Because 
indigenous peoples were using hundreds of different kinds of plants in their diets, and it's extremely healthy to eat like that. Where we look at today, most people eat less than 20, 20 different varieties because they go to the store, they buy the same thing every single time. You get tomato, onion, garlic, apple, mm -hmm. and you can barely count to 20, you know, for what you eat on a normal basis. So it's important to think like there's all this stuff right outside our back door and we should be utilizing that knowledge. You make a great point just for, and I, I mean, I think we probably have one of the more complex diets because of the industry that we're in, but you yeah. make a great point in just how we eat. Yeah. So you've, okay, so you've spoken at the UN, you've won the James Beard Award, uh, best cookbook. You were the voice on, NPR on Thanksgiving uh, telling the story of, of, of the actual Thanksgiving. And that was is, actually in a Time magazine and NPR did the interview, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a huge mantle. Yeah. And we feel really honored and really lucky to even have that platform to be able to voice a lot of this perspective because the indigenous perspective is often so overlooked. Right. And that's just because of the state of things that happened, you know. So, you know, it's a it's a tough period. So us to, for us and our small group and the friends and our networks who are working really hard on um, revitalizing indigenous culture through food and the food sovereignty movement that's happening with indigenous with Indian country across the board. Um, you know, we feel all very lucky that it's getting starting to gain momentum and people are noticing. Um, and we're hoping that we can start to see Native American restaurants all over the board someday. So where do you, Sean Sherman? I know the answer to this already, <laughs> but I want them to know. What do you do with that mantle? Where are you going with all this? So our vision, what we are working on right now, um, we wanted to do something bigger than just open up, a, say, a restaurant in Minneapolis, because that literally would have locked us in a box, right. right? And I don't want to be locked in a box. Right. So we started a nonprofit called Natives, um, which is uh, short for the long, uh, for an acronym, is uh, North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems. So Natives is our vision of what we're trying to do. So through Natives, it's a 501c3. We're opening up a brand called the Indigenous Food Lab that's going to start in Minneapolis, because that's where we're based out of. So Indigenous Food Lab is a live restaurant that's open to the public, and it's going to have a training kitchen so people can come in and take classes so we can teach people um, indigenous education around food. So food, uh, native agriculture, seed saving, soil management, farming technique, um, ethnobotany, wild food, identification, usage, harvesting, um, cooking techniques, food preservation, you name it. We're going to have a platform to be able to offer classes around this really important knowledge that we should be a part of our curriculums, right? Um, and our goal is to use the restaurant as a training center so people can come work inside the restaurant with us because live on-the-job training is so valuable mm -hmm. and we want to be able to offer space where we can do support and training because our goal is to work with the tribes around us to help them to develop their own indigenous food entity in these communities because food access is a huge issue out there there's some native communities that all they have is a gas station and it's 60 miles to the next grocery store and your only choices are commodity food program products or a gas station products which is just try to find something healthy in a gas station right it's right. just not going to happen so we want to create something that pro that promotes health and culture because each one can be unique to the tribe that it's in with the language, the culture, the history, the land, the food, all of that. And it can open up doors for them to become more food producers. They can be mm -hmm. selling things that are specific to their areas into that network. And we want to take this whole model of indigenous food lab in the city and satellites in the tribal regions and move it all over the place so we can open up indigenous food labs in cities everywhere. We can be in Seattle, we can be in Chicago, we can be in Denver, we can be in Phoenix. Sarah Minnesota, if you can be yep. everywhere. And yeah. each one can, can uh, spread out around it to whatever tribal regions are in there to create this broad food network. And we can do it in not only the U.S., but throughout Canada, Alaska, and eventually even Mexico, and hopefully kind of set a precedent for other indigenous communities around the world, because we see this vein of indigenous communities around the world. We've been able to travel mm -hmm. around the world quite a, a couple of times now and work with people, indigenous communities from all over the place, Africa, India, Southeast Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, South America. Same story, same colonial history, same destruction, same assimilation, mm -hmm. all of that. And then destruction of the foodways where their original traditional foods were so healthy with uh, so much plant diversification, really healthy for the environment and the soil, um, at low glycemic scale. So you're not just you know turning things into fat to create diabetes and mm -hmm. cancer and heart disease and all these other issues that we have. Because all of our foodborne illnesses are it's what we're putting in our bodies physically. We're taking it with our own hand and making ourselves sick with the food choices that we have. Right. And some communities don't even have that choice. They just eat because that's what they have available because they need to survive. But we can make a difference if we can spread this knowledge out there of 
how to perceive uh, utilizing the land differently. So that's our main goal. Yeah. Well, uh, let's cook. All right. But what I love about this is that your plan is that it's not the Sean Sherman show. No, it has nothing to do with me. Exactly. I, I'm happy to be a voice for sure, but yeah. this was always bigger. It was never an ego project, you know, which yeah. is a little different in the culinary world because a lot of times in the culinary world, it's about a chef. You my know, point. My a, point exactly, ladies so. and gentlemen. Yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. Well, all right. We're going to cook. All right. Right. When you win the James Beard, by the way, you get this really nice leather uh, <laughs> knife carrying bag. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna make chili dogs. <laughs> or not. Oh my God! Welcome to the State Fair uh, segment of the I Madison, am from Minnesota. No, yeah, no, the I'm Madison from College South Chef Demo Series. <laughs> Um, there's a couple pieces, so we just like to look at foods in a few different ways. Um, and I wanted to do something, a dish that had a few different styles of things that we can play with. And flavors that you can find right here, and they do have a cultural history right here. So um, basically we're going to make some, um, we have the, which fish did we get? I didn't even ask. Uh, we got a beautiful white fish. We got the beautiful yeah. white fish. Was yeah. it from this region, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. So we got some white fish fillets. We're going to make um, wild rice crust with that, and it's just going to be really simple. So there's a little bit of sumac in the crust and a little bit of salt, and it's just a really simple dish. Um, and then we're also um, going to talk about Nixmalai's corn. So we have this beautiful corn, um, and this is Oneida white corn. So this is from you know up in Green Bay, mm -hmm. right? Um, and they're growing this really wonderful seed that's been with them for so long. For millennia upon millennia. Yeah, for a yeah. long, long time. So it's a really special thing. So we're just doing the simplest thing to it is uh, nixmalizing it. If you don't know what nixmalizing is, um, you might know that as turning it into hominy or mm -hmm. pozole, depending on which part of the country you might be from. But if you think about Native American agriculture, indigenous agriculture, you know, it starts in the bottom of Mexico um, thousands of years back, right. shoots both directions, North and South America, throughout the whole Caribbean all along the eastern seaboard, up into parts of Canada, yep. all the way up the Mississippi, Missouri River Valleys. Um, so just huge spread of where indigenous agriculture was happening. So in these regions, people have been farming around here for almost 2,000 years. You yeah, know, so. I mean, people think of maize as being something that the Spanish encountered and that it's just a uh, Mesoamerican crop, but it had made its way all the way this north. Mm -hmm. And uh, same with squash. In fact, they just, you probably know this, but um, one of the extensions of uh, UW-Green Bay uh, on an architectural dig in Wisconsin found a squash that had been buried that was over 5,000 years old. What's amazing is that it still had seeds in it, so they replanted and grew it. So talk about discovering flavor profiles that yeah. have been lost to time. So we work with a lot of seed keepers around the U.S. looking at seeds from all over, from Mexico, from the Southwest, from New York, from mm -hmm. North Dakota, and there's a whole, but from Wisconsin, you know, from Illinois, there's a whole bunch of beautiful indigenous seeds out there. All sorts of varieties of corns. There's like blacks and yellows and golds and greens yeah. and whites and all sorts of colors out there, right? And the same with squash, there's all sorts of styles. This one's called a, a Getio Kosaman. This actually comes from the Miami tribe. Um, um, and it's got a Potawatomi name. Which it's we're not from story. Florida, by the way. But, the yeah. Miami tribe, are not from Florida. Right. Ohio uh, <laughs> is what we call that area now. But, uh, exactly. Definitely not from Florida. Um, but there's all sorts of wonderful squash all over the place out there. And again, um, beans of all sorts, um, sunflower seeds, amaranths, and beautiful tobaccos, of course. There's all sorts of cool stuff that people are growing all over the place. I was just down in the Yucatan um, mm -hmm. and exploring some of the Mayan communities, and it's so it's great to see, like, there was, you know, thousands upon thousands of people still speaking Mayan fluently down there, yeah. and learning about how advanced they were with architecture, uh, agriculture, um, sciences, and all this stuff. Like, uh, such an amazing history down there. Um, and again, a lot of the same stuff because it just gets tackled by colonial people, so the Spanish coming in, right? Right. But still, like, you know, corn culture and having that connection with the Mayan people directly and being able to talk about the corn, because we're just kind of like long, you know, distant cousins, you know? Yeah. Basically. So it's really great to see some of these pieces, but wherever corn culture went, the nixmalization of corn followed it because what happens when you nixmalize corn, we're gonna, basically you're gonna take some boiling water, we're gonna add a little bit of wood ash into this water and add a little sifter thing somewhere around here. Right here. Um, and you just kind of sift it out 
But what happens when you add wood ash into the water, it creates um, an alkaline bath. So when you're, in, when you're learning about cooking, you learn about cooking with acids and alkalines and the different ways it affects food, right? So when you're cooking the corn in the alkaline bath, um, what really happens to it, well first the outer, like the hard shell, uh, skin on the corn will soften up and eventually rub, a lot, rub away. Mm -hmm. And the kernel itself will swell up. But the most important thing about this process is that it actually makes this corn extremely soluble for your body to absorb the minerals. Right. So whenever you cook anything down into ash form, all that's left are the minerals, basically, right? So the corn, the nixtamalization corn process will help you absorb all that. So you get huge amounts of calcium, zinc, potassium, okay. iron, yep. all those those kinds of things and that's how people were staying really strong where they had corn culture because right. they could utilize this so when you nixmalize corn turn it into hominy pasole whatever dry it out um, grind it into a flour then you have masa harina which is what you might know of to the is the corn flour to make tortillas mm -hmm. and tamales with so mm -hmm. when you take that nixmalized corn flour it just acts completely different because you just add a little bit of water and it just creates a perfect dough you can make a you know tortilla you can add some fat and make a tamale to it sure, if those have... recipes are old because if you look at Mexican cuisine, Mexican cuisine is way more indigenous than it is Spanish or French. For sure. Yeah. yeah. It's not that hard to, to, to decolonize Mexican food. You just take away sour cream and cheddar cheese and... Black olives. <laughs> yeah, the weird California black olives. Right, right. <laughs> but, I mean, but this was how, if you, were, if, you were, if you were living on corn, but you were just eating it raw, corn on the cob or roasted, you would eventually uh, deplete your system because you wouldn't be getting, um, and you become anemic because you're not getting the minerals that uh, this process yields. It's also a really great Scrabble word, word uh, <laughs> mixalizing. This is a really good, you, yeah, can, yeah, you, you can get, get that. You can use up, you get an X, you get a lot of points, you can, no one else thinks of it. Anyway. Yeah, because when uh, the Spanish and Europeans first discovered the corn um, and started bringing it back towards Europe, they thought, oh, wow, what a great crop. We can feed a right. lot of these, especially these newer conquered countries. They were going crazy. They were all over the place, right? Yeah. So, um, but they actually didn't know about the nixtamalization process. So when they were feeding people just straight corn product, they made a lot of people sick, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. because they weren't getting the vitamins that they needed, they didn't take the time to learn right. you know, from the people on this side how to actually process the seed. It's the same price. The, the the story of uh, the story of native um, native plants going to Europe is almost its own, you know, payback. I mean, between corn and potato, uh, potatoes, there were so many things that if they just paid closer attention. There wouldn't have been that, yeah. Yeah, because people have obviously have been working with this food for a long time and really pretty much had it down. Right, you know, so. it's just fair to say, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, so anyways, whenever you nixtamalize corn, you get that final product. So when you get to this process, to this to this stage. Can you, you see it on the cameras, everybody? I don't know, can the camera see? I can see it. This way, good? Yes. Yes, okay. <laughs> right there? So okay. it basically just, it basically, you can grind this right now and, you know, make a bunch of cool, like, cornbreads and yeah. stuff like that. So it's really usable. They look like swollen up black-eyed peas without the black part. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and it's different because you can get con uh, canned hominy, of course, but that stuff, it's fine, but they use the commercial lye. Right. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have the texture and the flavor like a lot of these native corns by far. So I've never, I've never done this process, but does the flavor change? And it seems this like an obvious question, but based on the wood ash that you use? Uh, um, we, a lot of hardwood ash. So um, in South Dakota, we use a lot of ash tree because we had that. Yep. Southwest, I see a lot of people using juniper mm -hmm. um, ashes. So I know it changes a little bit here and there. And a lot of tribes have their own very method because it's so diverse. It's hard to like just right. have the one recipe because right. everybody was doing it slightly different. And you can, to, mix to, to create an alkaline bath, you can just easily use baking powder, basically, right? So yeah. it's the same process. Um, and it does work. We've done it before here and there. Um, one other thing that we're going to do that you guys are going to get eventually here is we're just, you know, something super simple. So this is just cedar. This is white cedar that grows outside. <laughs> <laughs> so they're investigating greenhouses and maybe someday we'll be able to scale it up in greenhouses. 
Um, but you know, it's wonderful. It's and this is basically all you can forage in Wisconsin and Minnesota right now. So. <laughs> um, but you know, we're just make a simple tea out of it. So we use this. And if you ever smelled cedar, you know, you crush it in your hands, and it's wonderful. got this beautiful yeah. aroma. And you know, yeah. we just make a simple tea out of it. And it's just as simple as tossing it in a pot of water and just letting it cook. So a lot of times we're doing uh, some outdoor events over the summer, and we'll just have a big pot going over the fire, and we'll just grab a bunch of tree stuff. So there'll be like some cedar and some white pine and maybe some spruce and you yeah. just have like all this kind of all these things to make a big tea and you just have this to kind of sip on all day you know cool. it's just that simple and it tastes like the forest and this yeah. was our only this was the only beverage we sold on Tatanka truck was just cedar and maple tea so we just used cedar branches and pure maple and that was all we sold for beverage it was iced and it was really, yeah. really great so, right um, so again like all these foods are super super simple so like when you nixmalize the corn you're going to see it start to turn a really Really bright yellow, and you can kind of see it starting mm -hmm. just a little bit there. Can you see that in the camera? You Does that probably pick up can. On? It doesn't have a lot in there, but um, the corn itself, even when we're using blue corns and stuff, that you'll see that inside kernel just hit this vibrant yellow right. for a little bit, and then you know right. that process is working, um, and then eventually it'll swell them up like this. So it's just a, it's kind of a process, but it's really pretty simple. You know, people have been doing it for a long time, and it's a really fun fun thing to do. Um, Couple ingredients, you know, we just kind of grabbed a bunch of stuff. So um, yeah, what are those, my friend? So this is actually timsala, and I just brought this as an example because I just thought we'd be talking about indigenous foods. But this is something that I grew up with because we talk about staples a lot. Um, so this is a prairie turnip that grows out in the Great Plains. So this was all over when I was growing up. This wow. was in my backyard, and this is really um, typical to see in Lakota homes. Um, a lot of times it's just wall decoration, but this is how people were surviving in the Great Plains for a long time because this stuff would grow, used to grow all the way from Texas all the way up into Canada along that wow. huge stretch, you know. Yeah. Um, but we've lost a lot of it. Um, part of the way some of the land had changed was, number one, loss of bison. Sure. Because the bison would grind up, the, you know, chur up the ground and yeah. help this plant grow. And people would actually follow this as it was growing in seasons and kind of move with it as it kind of flourished northward, right? Wow. Because it was a huge staple because you can grind this up into a flower, make breads with it and do all sorts of stuff. So is this dried at the moment, but it, it yeah. would be so soft like, you, like a... Basically, when you harvest it, you um, peel it um, just to kind of get this white bulb, and then they braid it up with the roots. And Okay. It's just this huge long braid, yeah. you know. So, and this was pretty typical styling. Um, and we grew up with a lot of this. We harvested those a lot growing up, and you had to get them by early. You had to wait to the right time because the plants would grow, and we'd see it. And then you had to wait till it seeded because if you took it too early, mm. then it wouldn't be there the next time around, right. Right? right? So you had to wait till it seeded, and then you could pull it up. But then if you waited too long, it would actually dry up and break off, and then you didn't know where the where yeah. the tubers were underneath sure. the ground. So it's just thinking about staples because, like where we are, you know, wild rice has been such a huge staple for these lake these lake and forest regions you know mm -hmm. so this true wild rice if you guys have only had black wild rice in a rice aroni box that's not true wild rice it's from the roni <laughs> it's from the roni tribe it's of from california the, the roni tribe everybody yep. knows that Sean. Yeah, they're around san francisco yeah right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but anyways you know that we are so lucky that we Chief even have <laughs> yeah. that roni. we even have this stuff growing around here we've lost a lot of it yeah. and you know it's such an important resource, and that's why we see a lot of people working really hard to try to keep oil pipelines out of their natural wild rice beds because we don't want to waste. We don't want to even chance losing more of this beautiful resource because we should have enough of this to feed everybody. You know, mm -hmm. there's so much wild rice that we could be producing. Yeah, um, and we, it's just been something that's been keeping you know making people happy, indigenous communities happy, and, and surviving off of for such a long time. And it and it used to grow. Uh, en masse basically from uh, the Finger Lakes of New York all the way through almost to the Dakotas, yeah. uh, much like cranberries. But if you think about now where you get great wild rice, you get it from northern Minnesota and a little bit of northern Wisconsin only. Yeah, and bits in Canada too. Yeah, right. Yeah, that, thank the black you. wild rice was modified so it could be harvested in patty. So we just call that patty rice basically because they can use machinery and combines to harvest that that black stuff, and it cooks completely different. You the know? real stuff was um, harvested by a canoe, as this was, with yeah. someone knocking the no rice petroleum in. products at all. It's just two knockers and a canoe, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 That's not a joke. That's but yeah, it's just. <laughs> 
<laughs> keep it at campus, keep it at college, here at Madison College. <laughs> um, so again, uh, just kind of going through some of these ingredients. Um, we used, uh, these beans are some white, small white beans. So great northern beans actually have a history of coming from the North Dakota tribes, mm -hmm. like the Mandans and the Hidatsas. I didn't know that. Uh, um, but a lot of those great beans, you know, yeah, are, come are from North all American. Those, exactly. Yeah. So these are actually white tepperies, and these come from uh, quite a bit south of us right now, but they're just a great Native American varietal. Um, and But there's all sorts of cool native beans out there. Um, and we cooked this down with uh, cedar, so we just threw this into the mix when we were cooking the beans. And these kind of beans are actually really tough, and they take forever to cook. Mm. You know? um, but we're just going to do a really simple preparation with that, um, with some of the cedar. Um, and then we're going to do the fish in a second. Um, and yeah, it's just going to be a really kind of simple as you were simple dish. As you were discovering recipes and creating recipes like this during your six years of your second self-teaching, right? Your self-taught chef twice. How many times did you almost poison yourself, <laughs> make something really <laughs> awful, realize uh, these two things do not mix? You, you know, you, you get where I'm going here. Well, you know, I've... Uh, you know, there's been definitely a couple times where I ate something I probably probably sh should have researched a little bit harder before I stuck it in my mouth. It wasn't poison ivy, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, definitely adventurous. But I can tell you, like, I felt much worse after a night playing pool when I was in my 20s for sure. So I feel like it's much safer <laughs> to take my chances in the forest, you know. <laughs> With things that grow outside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna take, these fillets are beautiful. Aren't they? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And we're using, by the way, a super dope um, Volrath induction oven. And I say that with all authority because we have one and we love it and we've turned a bunch of our chef friends onto it. The ability to dial in on the heat on these things is so great. And it's also the reason why um, my wife and I didn't have an argument on Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, these things are great because we travel around a lot and we um, bring these with us, you yeah. know, because we find ourselves in all sorts of different situations and it's nice just to have something that we can, you like, know. Like, boom, and there's no flame and you like, you just, yeah, exactly. you're, you're on, you're ready to cook. Um, so this is some wild rice flour that's just ground up, so it's just the raw wild rice and it's just ground into a flour. And it's fun to think about, like, all the different kinds of things you can do with some of these simple ingredients. So wild rice, you can just take Take it raw, grind it into a really fine flour to do something, and we're just going to make a really simple um, dredge for this fish. This is some sumac, which you guys would see growing all over here, and it's probably the only other thing you can find and growing out there right now. And it's the only like red color that's out there in the forest at the moment, right? The uh, the entire native population of the Americas before colonialists got here were in fact gluten free. <laughs> um. There there was a little bit of barley, uh, indigenous barley that had yeah? some gluten, and that was like the only only thing that I, that I found in my studies. So we've got a little bit of salt. And if you guys want to know about salt, that's another pretty cool history. Yeah, lay it on us. So salt, of course, humans need salt to survive. Obviously, you need sodium in your diet. Um, and, you know, we look at who, where, where were people getting salts. So um, where I was at in the Dakotas, North Dakota is basically one gigantic ancient ocean bed, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's a whole bunch of springs that come up from uh, the bottom through North Dakota and pop up, and there's natural salt springs all over the Dakotas. Yeah, there was an inland sea that went through the middle of North America. Mm -hmm. And it... Um, is people would just harvest that salt water. So even along the edge of Minnesota and North Dakota, the Red River area, um, that whole northern part of Minnesota was a bunch of salt springs throughout that whole area. And farmers have been battling them forever. They try to dynamite them because well, they yeah. think it's not good for their soil. But yeah. um, you know, it is what it is. But so that's one method that people were getting salts from. Another method was um, there was a lot more mineral salt towards the east. So there was a lot of tr um, trade happening in some of these areas. Mm -hmm. um, so people were able to harvest 
harvest some of these salts coming right directly from the earth, you know? If you're on the coastline, it's the easy one, because right. you're, again, it's salt water, so you're just cooking it down. You can cook it all the way down into... You're getting in the oysters you eat. You're getting crystal, in all kinds yeah. of... Yeah. And you're just getting in your seafood, you're getting yeah. all that kind of stuff. But um, animals have some sodium, too, but plants actually have quite a bit of sodium. Hmm. And when you're cooking with um, a lot of uh, this wood ash style method, because mm -hmm. not just corn was cooked with that, but people were adding uh, like corn, like corn cob ash and all sorts of other things. And again, once you cook anything down into ash farm, it's all minerals. So there's a bunch, some of them that contain a ton of sodium. And people are getting a lot of sodium from wood ash um, in their cooking. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. So I know you're not using olive oil here, chef. What is it? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I think this, it, we, typically we use um, sunflower oil um, because it's uh, easily accessible and there's quite a few sunflower producers around Minnesota and Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, so we use a lot of sunflower oil for our cooking with what we do right now. We use animal fats, of course, here and there, but sunflower oil is just something that's so great and it's healthy, it's light. We focused on uh, Driftless Organics, if you remember that show, The Wisconsin Foodie, where they are a full organic farm but uh, in the Driftless region, but to augment their CSA, uh, they grow sunflowers. But you can't just grow a few sunflowers to turn it into sunflower oil. So they did 50 acres. And um, people will come up to me and instead of saying, you know, my favorite part of Wisconsin foodie was that scene when you, it's undoubtedly and forever that scene when the drone flew over the sunflowers. <laughs> Because uh, it's just this river of sunflowers in full bloom. It's gorgeous. <laughs> so we're just going to let that get a little bit of a crust on it for All a second. Right. I'm going to kick this on, and we're going to toss the uh, nixonalized corn and the beans. And we're going to chop up just a little bit of cedar also. And you've got seasoning. some diced here, Chef. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He needs to feel better and show you that he can, yeah. he can chop. And he's got the culinary skills. <laughs> It's so funny, we use cedar just like an herb, knife, you know? though. Yeah, it's true. Um, you know, we this summer we did a big event in Tama, Iowa. It was mm -hmm. over an indigenous food conference, and we harvested um, a bison and used it over the course of a few days to feed a few hundred people. Um, and people were saving all the bones and all the pieces to it, just like we would normally. Um, and it's actually um, a bone that people would sharpen. And they'd use it as a as a squash knife, you know. So it's really super cool. cool. Yeah. Wow. So you see that in a lot of the. Uh, um, we've um, we've made really good connections with a lot of museums. So Field Museum, Heard Museum, Smithsonian's mm -hmm. have been able to tour a lot of their collections and see a lot of these pieces in real time, which has helped us really kind of solidify a lot of our yeah. theories and what we yeah. think people are doing and just see in real time like Techniques. a lot of these beautiful things, you know? Right, right. And just see like how, of course, food is playing such an important role was, in everybody's life. Was you know? there ever uh, a time with one of those museums where they had it labeled as this and you said, no, that's thus? Yeah, a lot of times it's all, it's really um, pretty normal to see that because um, a lot of these things just get documented past real quick, so it'll just be Native American tea, and that would be like, well, like, well that's Labrador, you know, <laughs> or something. <laughs> so a lot of times it's just mislabeled completely, yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, so it's great for us to be able to work with some of those collections to be able to see, you know, the value in, and then what they really are, right. and just completely miss, there's some, so many times they're so mislabeled, because I've been to some museums where they'll pull out a bunch of stuff of like, oh, we pull out a bunch of Lakota stuff for you to look at. And it's like, well, that's obviously Anishinaabe because it's just like, you know, just the simple floral work compared to the geometrics, you know? It's like, but it says Pine Ridge. Like, well, somebody might have, you know, lived in Pine Ridge. I don't know, but it's, yeah. you can definitely tell, you know, yeah. there's some simple pieces there. Which is the equivalent of like, you know, just like European this, and you pull out something like, well, that's pretty much Polish, even though you have it in the Italian exhibit. Uh, Take my word so for it. That's looking good. Um, so the squash, all we did to it was roast it till it was super tender, which I have some right here. And we have one more bowl. And this stuff is just so tender at this state that we're just going to add a tiny bit of salt and a little bit of maple, just to just to give it an extra sweet edge. And that's pretty much it. And we just made basically a nice little squash puree. 
Um, and again, because we cut out dairy, wheat flour, processed cane, sugar, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff, you know, the foods that we do are so dietary friendly because it's gluten-free, sugar-free, soy-free, right. pork-free, you yeah. know? Um, so like we're just, you know, it's kind of like what paleo diet wants to be, right? <laughs> <laughs> they should just buy your book, quit their whining, yeah. Uh, or signing up for their own version of Blue Apron. Like just, just get Sean's book, everybody, and calm down. Right. Uh, um, it's it's what I'm realizing here with your cooking is that you know when people extol the virtues of really great honest authentic Italian cooking they're like three four ingredients tops that's all it has right well turns out really good authentic uh, indigenous cooking three four ingredients tops that's all it needs yep so I'm gonna put some of these beans in here and a little bit of this mixed corn. And a little bit of the chopped cedar. A touch of salt. And then this is actually um, some pure maple vinegar. So I had found, um, cool. I had found in writing that um, traditionally one group was taking the last dregs of the maple. They would use it because it would be kind of too weak to cook down. So from the sap, and they would take that sap, rinse out all of their stuff, put it into pots, and just set it aside and just let it ferment. And it would just turn into this maple over the next couple months, and then they would have this for the rest of the year. It's like gnarly delicious. Yeah, and it's just, it's just pure maple. It's sweet and astringent all at the same time, and you're not used to those mixing in your nose or anywhere. All right. And you can see how this tea like gets such a beautiful color so fast. Can right? you see that in the camera, the green? It's really uh, leached out, and I mean up? that in the best way. And we just, you know, we'll put just a tiny bit of maple in it. And you don't need very much because a little maple goes a long ways. And you think about like. Tell that to our kids. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had my son do one of those science projects where they um, basically. You know, take a can of soda or a bottle of soda or a bottle of whatever yeah. and then put how many sugar cubes are in it. You know, it's insane. Like, you yeah. know, it's, it's like yeah. so insane. Like 12 sugar cubes in a little tiny thing of water right. or a little container. Yeah. And like, who would, like, you know, if you get a coffee, you know, you're like, can I get 12 sugar, sugar cubes, cubes to go <laughs> to with, go that? with yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> it's insane how much sugar is in our food. So. Or if you split it out, it's like, okay, eat all these sugar cubes, drink this much water, and drink this caramel coloring. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. So all of these pieces are super simple. And one last piece that we're going to do also is um, take this pure wild rice, and we're just going to puff it up. So I'm just going to let this pan get hot, and we're just going to pop it. So it'll take a moment here. I like it. I like it. And then we're just going to put together a nice little plate yeah. with all these wonderful, simple foods, you know, and it's that easy. Um, and we really like to cook with thinking about what's around us and what's the history of the land that we're standing on, you know. So we might have something with like cedar and rabbit and wild rice and cranberry and watercress. And you can literally stand in one spot and look around and see all those ingredients like right there. So it's really thinking about food like that. Right. You know, where, what would you find? Like if you're in Manhattan, if Manhattan was the original state you know, of, you know, before it's just a metropolis now, but like right. what was there, just imagining all the pieces that should be there, the plants that are there, the fish that would have been in that region, yeah. the animals. The or natural if oysters. In, you that, know, yeah. Exactly, or if you're in the Northern California region in the Redwoods or something, like it's all that kind of same thought process. So, well, we do have, and this might be a good time, we do have uh, little culinary examples of this for you. Yeah. So you will be served some of, uh, some of Sean's recipes. Um, well, you puff up the wild rice. I think we could probably open up for questions if you're okay with that yeah, at the same time. Yeah, that'd be great. We'll open up for questions and then um, Sean's got books for sale and to sign at the end as well. So just if you're planning, you should get a book. Uh, but yeah, does anyone have any questions for Chef Sherman? There's one here in the front. Um, so I'm an A12 chef in the school room, and one of the biggest concerns that always comes up is food safety. So how do you do foraging and still have food safety when you're working in the professional setting? Wear boots. You should wear boots <laughs> and a warm jacket. And avoid bears. 
<laughs> They're very dangerous. Um, you know, we're always very aware. So, you know, plants, uh, we look at plants. A lot of times we harvest a lot of wild foods with some of the farm partners that we work with. So we're working with, uh, there's a place in near Minnesota called Dream Wild Health. It's a native-run, nonprofit farm. They grow a lot of cool seeds like this stuff, and they have great youth programs and things like that. But we'll go out there and use, like, all of their fields, like all of the fringe stuff that's around them because they have all these, like, uh, wild hazelnuts and elderberry and choke cherry, um, bergamots and hyssop and wild gingers in the forest and like all this cool. stuff just like on the land and they have license to sell you know uh, farmed goods and plants coming from their farm and it just happens to be you know there's domesticated versions of that and there's the wild stuff that's right there too but we take very you know clear we take a lot of care in making sure that we rinse everything really well process everything and I lived in you know Mexico for a while too where you basically have to you know clean all your fruits and vegetables constantly you know you're basically putting iodine in some water and soaking them to kill off any potential mm. hazardous bacteria. Um, so there's definitely ways that you can protect yourself if you're worried about it. But you know, a lot of the world actually survives like that of having to be yeah. very aware of contagions that might be out there. So we just, you know, but these foods are super healthy and, and we know how old the food is and where it comes from compared to a can of Folgers coffee because that stuff could be from the 1950s. You have no idea, right? <laughs> you, I would know because the labeling's changed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, point, the, but the beans itself, right. you have no point, idea. Point taken, point taken. Uh, I'm sure there's other questions. Yes, right here, sir. So we're talking about the sodium content of foods, and here you're obviously using refined salt. How much would that have been used for refined versus? So mineral compared to like like um, where I read for a lot of where I was at um, it was mostly like a really salty tonic that they'd cooked down not into the powder form, but I've seen other places where they would actually cook it all the way down. Where like basically they'd have a big like rock with a divot in it and just pour the water in there and just put like a hot coal in there mm -hmm, and it mm -hmm. would just like or a hot rock you know and it would just boil out all that water and all that would be remaining would be the resi re residual yeah. salt yeah. crystals and stuff like that. So they're able to scoop up and use that that for seasoning so there's quite a few different ways you know and again it's just there's a lot of diversity out there so it's hard to say there was just one way to do everything and that's the second oldest form of cooking uh, archaeology has discovered I mean basically that pot before we could form them right uh, and then when they could be formed with clay but where water was heated underneath a fire or near a fire uh, or more specifically stones were heated to a great intensity moved the branches and then put into that water mm -hmm. yeah yeah so we, it goes, we call that sous vide right <laughs> uh, <laughs> any other any other questions for the smart ass <laughs> chef <laughs> I know that there's more out there. Please. Anyone? Yes, right here. So my question is, where, where do you get your ingredients from? Uh, well, we try to purchase from indigenous vendors whenever we can, and that's been our model. Um, so a lot of these ingredients actually came from um, the Native Food Network, which is right here in Madison. So we bought all this stuff from a local guy, Dan Cornelius. I don't think he's here, is he? You guys haven't seen Dan? Dan? Um, no. But you know, um, and, but Yusuf and Elena work with Dan, and they have a whole bunch of uh, indigenous ingredients from all over the nation, basically. Um, but we try to purchase whatever we can locally, of course. So in Minnesota, we're buying from a lot of the native tribes around Minnesota. Minnesota, but you know we're close. To, we're almost Wisconsin, so yeah. we um, you know buy from over here. Right. <laughs> we're not quite perfect. Uh, sorry, right. sorry. Right. We accept you anyway. <laughs> when I called but, Sean to ask him, ask him, uh, uh, pitch him, and ask him if he could be part of the series, he was in Wisconsin. Um, and but his geography was off. He was like, "Oh yeah, I'm in the Dells. That's really close to Madison, isn't it?" I'm like, "Well, it's not quite as close, but yeah." <laughs> yeah. But you were like, you were like breaking down venison and and and, uh, and bison or something that day. Yeah, we had a really nice community event with the Ho Chunk there. Yeah. Uh, the casino and the community yeah. right behind it. So yeah. That was fun. Yeah. And we get to go out and do that a lot. So we've been to 
communities all over the nation um, and working with communities down in Mexico and mm -hmm. um, it's it's a lot of fun there's so much cool stuff out there and there's so much wonderful food and you know any chef should be really excited about this kind of food and you know when we first started one of the first things that we did as a chef team was hire an ethnobotanist right because um, we wanted to just help like I've been learning plants for a while but it was great to have somebody on the team that was who, who, who specialized well, she, yeah she was she, you know she was trained in it that's what her studies were and we were just able to grow so I think all culinary teams should have an ethnobotanist right because yeah. we're always playing with plants and you can just open up the door for so much more right around you and plus it's just a lot easier to teach an ethnobotanist how to cook than a cook ethnobotany so uh, well played thanks <laughs> Um, the way that I first met Sean, or we first met, was actually a dinner that he was doing at uh, Potawatomi at the casino. And it was during, uh, I think, Native American Month. And they uh, bring in a chef like yourself, or Nephi Craig, or mm -hmm. uh, folks like that. And the platings were beautiful. Um, but I remember you were talking about dessert, and I was like, huh, how's he going to pull this one off? <laughs> no dairy at all, no refined sugar. You know, um, and of course it was just my neophytic mind thinking in European styles. So it is a trick, you know, to be able to figure out how to do things like that, how to make desserts with only or you know removing dairy and wheat flour and cane sugar, and just being you know creative with it, basically. I'm going to move your plate, chef, okay. over here. So you can see. Yeah, if I put it here, can you see it on the camera? Is that a good? No. You can find a spot. How about if we're on the, yeah? All right, super. Because that's really beautiful. So you've got the corn, you've got the squash, and then the whitefish, mm -hmm. crusted whitefish. Yep, and then um, a little bit of some watercress, and watercress is so good, you know? That you can also um, find outside. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Any other questions, by the way? Sorry, I got off topic a little bit. Yes, in the back right here. Hi, I was just wondering, um, with like modernization or urban, urban places popping up all over, it's super real all over. Um, are there any ingredients that you uh, that we've lost over the years that you're worried about protecting or making sure that? Well, there's a lot of wild foods out there that we have to be really careful with because of how people may have over harvested um, or ruined completely. Um, so when it comes to the wild foods, we're really gentle with them and we use them more as accents when we use them a lot of times because we're not trying to destroy more resources out there. Mm -hmm. and we try to use things that are more readily available like wild rice and squash and corns. And, but things like timsala, you're not gonna find that on a commercial market. you know. So as we use it sparingly, um, a lot of times we use it in ceremonies and we're really careful with it but um, we just have to be really conscious of it you know and we uh, we talk about cultural appropriation even a lot too because you know some people might want to capitalize on Native American foods because it's new and it's gonna get hot and things like that and some people who are non-indigenous might want to jump on that and you know open up something and try to do it but it might be doing it wrong it might be pulling the right. wrong resources through it and not benefiting any um, indigenous community out of it the Taco Bell effect right <laughs> a little bit and we look at America Mexican food is a perfect example because Oaxacan food is super Super hot right now, and we see some of the top chefs all over the place and celebrating Oaxacan foods. But you know, we basically they're in. They can have some really dangerous conversations of basically Columbusing. Like, look, I'm a European chef, and I discovered this wonderful cuisine. Right. You know? So right. Right. we want to be really clear because it's really important to allow the indigenous peoples, especially of this continent and South America, and many other places where colonialism played a really um, hard history, for them to define what their foods are going to be for this future for them to be able to have that voice and that opinion to make that happen. They need to be able to create that definition. Um, and it's the same, you know, at the James Beard Award, because my friend Michael Twitty won um, two awards doing yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and his work with Afro Culinary and really trying to redefine what that really means. And those opinions are really important because America has had a really rough history. It's been an extremely racist history. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of bad things have happened. And we're at a point in history where we can really start to 
redefine how we move, how we can be more inclusive with culture, how we can hold on to these cultures and not try to assimilate everything into one, but to really celebrate the diversity that's out there and showcase the importance of all these different cultures around us, especially when it comes to, uh, well, for us, when it comes to the indigenous communities, because we just want to give back, especially I want to give back, you know, growing up on Pine Ridge, where still today, you know, it's over 70% of the population living in poverty, meaning they make less than $6,000 a year for the, for the family, right? Wow. So yeah. there's a lot of work to be done, and there's a lot, uh, obviously, you know, there could be um, a lot of opportunity for Native chefs and young Native kids to come in and do this kind of work. Um, and we're hoping to create a situation that can help grow this and help push it into a healthy future, you know? So what's the good way to reconcile that? Because um, uh, Michael's a friend of ours, and he'll be actually in Milwaukee next month. Awesome. Yeah, and, and uh, you have a quote here in the back of your book, uh, an endorsement from Sean Brock, who also won the James Beard Award, and he was cooking in the Southeast in the Carolinas. And uh, he was one of the chefs that, that Michael took, uh, well, took to task, I guess, at one point, because he was, you know, um, essentially a, a, a white southerner mm -hmm. that was taking on native, or excuse me, not, uh, not native foodways, but um, foodways from the south mm -hmm. that were really traditions that African American slaves brought with them when they came and then turned into deliciousness out of necessity mm -hmm. and oppression. And uh, Michael didn't necessarily pick a fight with him, but he did say, Sean, where does your authority come from? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you have to be black to be cooking that way, mm -hmm. but are you aware of the history? And they went back and forth and it ended up respectfully, but what if a great chef were to come along and start doing native uh, indigenous food ways that was not in fact uh, from one of the tribes. And it's really about like, are they purchasing the foods from an indigenous vendor? Are they trying to do something to support the growth of that? Um, are they trying to raise awareness? Are they, you know, basically are they an ally when it comes down to it, right? Yeah. Um, so, but that's really where it kind of lies. And, you know, if you're not doing that, if it's just out for a self gain, then that's a clear definition of cultural appropriation. So it's no different than um, selling Navajo jewelry if you're not Navajo, you know, when it comes down to it, right? Right. So it's really just, and it's having those open conversations and it's talking about that. And it's great, people should be able to celebrate the land and the foods and the plants out there and have that knowledge and you know, celebrate it. But you don't have to capitalize off of it necessarily. And you, if you wanted to help support and grow this, you can support the native communities that really need that support too. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, so, and, okay, any other questions? Paul, do we have samples coming out for everybody? Awesome. All right, fantastic. Uh, are there any other questions? Sir? Yeah, please. Keep them coming. Um, what, if any, would be like a role for agriculture in your project? What would the role be in agriculture? Or, yeah, or what would the role for agriculture be? I, I'm on the board with Dream Wild Health, which I talked about briefly, which is a native-run farm in Minnesota. I'm also on the board with Seed Savers Exchange, which is based in Decorah, Iowa, and they're one of the nation's oldest nonprofit seed banks in America. They have like. 70,000 seeds in the bank or something like that. Cool. Um, and this last year we um, did a program where they um, looked through the vaults to see if they could find any seeds that hadn't been utilized that had directly come from native tribes and were able to pull out over 100 of them and last year they grew out 25 of them for seed to get them back in the hands of native farmers and growers because there's, we're creating this demand and there could be a great opportunity for the tribes to really grow out some of these pieces that directly belong to them. So there's all these wonderful Potawatomi seeds, of course, like the Oneida corn, mm -hmm. you know, there's Hidatsa, Mandan, Ponca, Pani. There's just so many different groups out there that were part of this corn culture and agricultural um, movement that had happened centuries and millennia back um, that could be celebrated because we, we're lucky that we have any of those seeds left. So agriculture is a huge part of it. But then we also look at a huge chunk of North America where agriculture didn't happen, but they were celebrating more of a permacultural design by really making sure that these plains and these forests were actually really well maintained to be able to produce a lot of food. You know, so agriculture is a really key piece, of course, and it has an, an immense history. And the further south you go, the more cool, older history you start to find with a lot of that stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, especially, yeah, especially Mesoamerica. Mm -hmm. um, Sean points out in one of the presentations, but when, uh, you know, people get excited about um, raised beds right now and having food grow that way, when the Spaniards first arrived, uh, that's what they witnessed in the great cities in Mexico, mm -hmm. were raised beds with an opportunity to feed literally thousands upon thousands of people within a major metropolitan center. So that technology and that thought 
goes way back. Any other uh, questions? I'm sure there's more. I'm just curious, Sean. So I had, oh, I'm sorry. I had a coworker who is a vegetarian ask me to describe what gamey tastes like. What game meat tastes like? And I was at a loss for words. It tastes like penguin. <laughs> <laughs> which, which tastes like chicken? Just stronger. That's really good. Um, I'll take a stab at that, uh, no pun intended, but I don't, I mean, I think gamey is just, uh, I don't think you really know it until you know it. It's, um, and it's different for, like it isn't, there isn't a broad swath, it's different for every animal. Yeah. Uh, and it's different for every animal at the time that they were harvested, meaning at the time And the preparation of Preparation, method. And yeah. there's a lot of variables into it. Yeah. So people will say lamb is gamey sometimes. Right. People will say venison right. is gamey. But if you cook it down, like we just had venison back there and it was amazing, it was right? a, Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, so you can, process foods in different ways, but it is important to know some technique to be able to make foods taste good, because humans love food, and you know, the yeah. chefs like to make food taste good, ideally. Right. <laughs> I mean, deer hunters, deer hunters in northern Wisconsin will say that, uh, because there's so much wild sage up there, that, it, that, the, that the deer is already pre-seasoned with sage. Mm -hmm. And I've never tasted it, but there are people that I know that swear that there is a, a, a sage taste to that deer, so. Yeah, it's like, you know, antelope and yeah. mule deer and things like that in the right. Dakota Plains, you know, because yeah. they're just surviving off of those kinds of plants. Right. So yeah, you right. get a little of that flavor in there. So it changes, yeah. yeah. It definitely changes, but it does taste like penguin. <laughs> uh, which, which is on uh, page 148, it's a great recipe. Um, any other question, one last question, and then we'll let you uh, continue munching, and Sean will come uh, out and sign Penguin is actually the new state bird of Minnesota, too, just so you know. <laughs> you <laughs> right here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Dan's got a question. I actually just wanted to give more of a shout out and just uh, go into a tiny bit more detail on a couple of the ingredients. The wild rice is Wisconsin uh, hand harvested wild rice. And then um, the white fish. Now it's, um, it's kind of crazy to me of, we've got fish fries all across southern Wisconsin and despite all of this, you know, eat local, buy local. Um, I don't really know where you can go to get whitefish. Uh, this whitefish is a Lake Superior whitefish uh, from Red Cliff. It's actually from a fisherman by the name of Matt Hipscher. Uh, he also does um, grass-fed beef, but the whitefish eats low in the food chain, so it's not accumulating as much of the mercury and the other biotoxins as like a lake trout or a, or a salmon would. Um, so it's really healthy for you, and uh, you know. So just as you're thinking about ingredients that you might be buying, you can oftentimes find it at the Willie Street Co-op uh, Seafood Center, and we're working with uh, with Redcliffe actually on opening up a fish processing facility up there. So just wanted to give a little bit more context on that ingredient. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. And it's true, all you good Wisconsinites who go out and eat uh, whitefish or perch fish fries or cod, certainly um, on Fridays, most of that is coming from the Baltic Sea. Uh, it's coming from the Baltic Sea. <laughs> yeah. So it's not coming from Lake Michigan. There is still some great whitefish you can get out of Lake Superior. Uh, but um, you are, yeah, you are participating in global, uh, in global supply chains when you go for a fish fry on a Friday night yeah. in Wisconsin. And Red Lake Nation is one of the few places where you can find uh, domestic walleye. Walleye. You know, that's wild. Yeah. Right out. Of, or, you know, it's domesticated up there. But yeah. it's, you know, that's a beautiful, clean, pure lake up there. So. Yeah. And the whitefish and the northerns and things like that. So you just don't really see that on these menus anywhere. I mean, in the producers anywhere. So. Right. It should be. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Chef Sherman. Let's All give right. him a round Thank of you applause. Guys. Thank you. This is a real treat for me and a treasure. Thank you, buddy. Thank you.